from the Sky News City Studio. Hopes of an imminent interest rate cut are dampened as wages continue to rise more rapidly than expected. Stock markets tumble across Europe following last night's sell-off on Wall Street. Plus, the chief executive of HSBC Innovation Banking on why UK startups are raising less money from venture capital than since the early days of the pandemic. Good morning. This is Business Live with me, Ian King. Hopes of an imminent cut in UK interest rates have been dampened this morning with news that wages are continuing to rise more rapidly than expected. The Office for National Statistics said that during the three months to the end of January, earnings excluding bonuses rose by 6% year on year. That was down from 6.1% during the three months to the end of January, but higher than the 5.8% expected by economists. The Bank of England has previously said that wages growth must slow before it can consider cutting interest rates. The ONS also said that unemployment during the period rose from 3.9% to 3.2 per cent. Also in the uh, statistical release came news that the number of vacancies in the economy fell by 13,000 during the three months to February. Uh, that was uh, keeping it uh, to 916,000. Well, we'll be speaking shortly to James Reid from the Recruitment and Staffing Group Regroup. But in the meantime, some other business news st stories for you now. And the FTSE 100 packaging company, D.S. Smith, has agreed to a takeover by US rival International Paper, valuing it at £5.8 billion or £7.8 billion, including debt. The agreement comes after D.S. Smith previously agreed in principle to a takeover by FTSE packaging group Mondi that valued it at £5.14 billion. Following the all-paper deal, investors in D.S. Smith will own 33.7% of the enlarged business. D.S. Smith began as a box-making business in London's East End in the 1940s. It now employs more than 30,000 people in more than 30 countries worldwide. The engineering services company T. Clark has agreed to a takeover by the privately owned Regent Group, valuing it at just under £91 million. T. Clark, which has been listed on the stock market for 75 years, began life as a provider of electric wiring materials that enabled the electrification of royal palaces, including Windsor Castle and St James's Palace. But it now provides a range of services to builders and infrastructure providers. Regent, which is owned by the entrepreneur Deep Valicha, is a leading supplier of gas and metering services to industrial and commercial customers in the UK. Back now to our top story and joining me is James Reid. He's chairman and chief executive of the employment agency Reid Group. James, good to see you this morning. Um, were you surprised by these figures? Do they tally with what you're seeing on the ground? Hello, Ian. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, they're pretty disappointing, aren't they, the figures? And not really, although some, some aspects I was more disappointed by than others. I mean, there was a blizzard of numbers, wasn't there, produced this morning by the ONS, but the... The key headlines are unemployment has gone up, inactivity has gone up, and job vacancies have gone down. And job vacancies have gone down for 21 consecutive periods in a row now. So that's unprecedented. I look back and the last time that job vacancies had a decline of anything like that was in the Great Recession of 2008-9, when they went down 16 periods in a row. So, yeah, there's not much in these numbers to be um, positive about, I'm afraid. Are you seeing particular sectors where vacancies are, are a little more robust than others, where you are still seeing jobs being created? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are areas which are, are doing significantly better. I mean, one sector that's, that's pretty vibrant is the education sector. And we've seen increases in jobs in that sector and also in pay. Um, and the other is, interestingly, in retailing. There have been quite a few new jobs coming through in retailing. But the big surprise is in our data that the IT and telecom sector has really been hit hard, you know, down 37%. And that's, um, that's quite surprising to me. In terms of uh, filling the gap where employers do have a vacancy, are they turning more to sort of temporary uh, labour rather than making permanent rec recruitment decisions? Well, it's interesting that quoted, some of the quoted um, recruitment companies have reported their results um, for the first quarter um, today and yesterday, and they're, they're showing numbers in the UK of declining income of 19, 20%, so significant drops. But where they are uh, stating that they're seeing some progress is in the temporary side. 
and and we're seeing that too in our business. When employers are, are nervous or unsure, they'll hire contractors and temporary workers first. So my hope is that that's a sign that things are beginning to turn. I mean, I do want to see these um, these declining vacancies uh, turn. You know, we haven't hit the bottom yet, so that there is there is um, still, I think, some hardship to come in the labour market. We haven't seen the bottom yet. When do you think things will turn then, James? Well, in my experience, and, and you can tell by looking at me, I've been around a while, um, recessions, and some people are calling this recession, some people are saying it isn't, but it's a flatlining economy for sure, and it feels like a recession. Recessions last six quarters, and I think we're three or four into this. Uh, so I think by the end of this year, things should hopefully be picking up a bit. James, if the labour market is softening, and there's a lot of evidence that it is, why is wages growth still so robust? I think there's something in. I think there's something of a lag in wages growth. So when um, inflation really bounced up last year, um, companies tried to keep up, and they had to compete for workers, and so they they put in pay increases that are coming through now. And I've seen in our data that the for the current jobs advertised, wages are up 4.8 percent, which is slightly lower than the um, data reported this morning by the ONS for the previous quarter. So it seems to me that the wage growth is cooling, which wouldn't surprise me given that the job market is also cooling. Um, the question is, how cold is it going to get? You mentioned uh, there the fact that you'd seen a slowdown in tech and IT in particular. I mean, this is an area where we keep being told there are major skill shortages. Yeah, and, and strangely, you know, there still are. So we've got something like a million young people in, in, in this latest set of statistics that are not working and they're in, that are described as inactive. And, and these are young people who could have been taught or, or, or given um, IT skills that would have given them good jobs, I think. And so there's not, a, there's not an adequate channel for people to move from school into education if they don't go down the traditional A-levels university route. And that's, um, that's something that needs to be urgently addressed. I think there should be a workforce strategy for the UK to help more young people progress into well-paid work. And that's something I hope that the political parties will look at, given that we're in an election year, because it's, it's desperately needed. I mean, there's, there's a huge number of young people who, who, who I feel are demoralised and marginalised because they haven't got the opportunities that they should have. OK, James, have to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Now, UK startups raised less money from venture capital during the first three months of this year than in any quarter since the early days of the pandemic. Some $3.9 billion was raised during the quarter, making it the lowest since the second quarter of 2020. That's according to a report published today by HSBC Innovation Banking and the data provider Dealroom. However, there are signs that VC investment levels are stabilising. Well, joining me now is Erin Platt. She's chief executive of HSBC Innovation Banking UK. Erin, very good to see you again this morning. Fairly disappointing quarter. Why was that, do you think? Well, I think, Ian, firstly, thanks for having me. But I do think it's important to put some context into this quarter. So $3.9 billion invested into UK. That still leaves us third globally in terms of an innovation economy. And it's just about the same level that Germany and France raised combined this quarter. Um, also, the context of pre, I think we're recalibrating or re-benchmarking to pre-COVID levels. So I'm not overly surprised. I actually think it's a, a good thing that we are benchmarking at that 2021 sort of levels. And I do expect some growth yeah, um, coming over the next couple of the yeah, quarters. 21 was a crazy year, wasn't it, for VC funding? It was, yeah. yeah. Um, very interesting to note that fintech has uh, recaptured its crown as the most uh, backed sector again. This time, when we last had you on, it was energy that was... Uh, exactly, yeah. 2023 was definitely the year of climate tech and sort of Gen AI, which is very much a, a horizontal from, from my perspective. But Q1, 2024, year, uh, quarter of fintech, um, over $1.4 billion invested into the subsector, some large rounds as well. So it's nice to see that continue in the UK, again, being a hub across Europe for fintech. Yeah, Monzo was uh, the big uh, raise in the mm -hmm. quarter, wasn't it? Do, do you see more of that coming as the year goes on? I think so, yeah. I do think the if you then look um, behind the data in terms of fintech, there's actually really good diversification of subsectors. So climate, but also healthcare, um, what we call frontier tech or deep tech. So um, quantum computing, Gen AI, semiconductors. So uh, fintech, I, I still think um, there's a great opportunity to invest. But again, really nice to see that diversification of subsector. 
Yeah, one thing I thought was particularly interesting about this quarter was that it was early stage funding. That was actually up on the previous two quarters. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a good trend that I hope continues because early stage investment um, definitely proves that we've got great founders, we've got great technology and innovation, and we're continuing to see spin outs from university occur. And that will leave us really well placed, not just for this year, but for the next couple of years across the UK. Worth noting that US investors put in more into the sector this quarter than domestic investors. Yeah, so this is a really interesting part of the report. And actually, I looked back over the last 15 years, and Q1 2024 actually saw the US being, it's the highest proportion of investment, almost 40% came from the US. And the UK proportion, um, domestic capital, has been quietly decreasing. So I do think this is something for us to continue to look at. We do want to crowd in international capital, but we also want that to complement really healthy domestic investors as well. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised by that, though, should we, when you've got the, the big guns from the US, the likes of General Catalyst, Sequoia, opening offices here now. I agree. And coupled now with some of the corporates that are rising, writing large checks into things like Gen AI. So it's the um, typical, more traditional venture capital investors, but now it's also the corporates who are going to be writing large checks. So I, I would anticipate we'll see more of that this year as well. And just a word on the regional picture. Important to stress, this isn't just a London phenomenon. There are businesses right around the country being backed. Absolutely. So last year we saw regions like Birmingham, the Midlands and the North attracting capital. It's great to see Q1, Cambridge, Oxford, but also Edinburgh and Brighton. So for me, having that diversification of geography is really, really a, a, a really positive data point that we're seeing. OK, Erin, got to leave it there. Lovely to see you again. Thank Likewise. you. Likewise. Well, last night's sell-off on Wall Street following a bumper set of US retail figures that sales figures that dampened hopes of an early interest rate cut were followed by declines overnight for stocks in the Asia-Pacific region. Hong Kong and Shanghai both fell despite news that Chinese GDP grew by 5.3% during the first three months of the year. That was better than expected and it represented a picking up of pace from the 5.2% growth seen during the final three months of last year. Well, that's been followed by a sell-off across Europe this morning. All of the main continental European indices in negative territory. There are one or two gainers to mention, though, and one big talking point today is Ericsson, the telecoms equipment maker, which is up some 6.5% in Stockholm after it flagged a recovery in sales. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 firmly in negative territory, off by uh, not far off 1.5% uh, on the session in a broad-based sell-off. The last time I checked, there were only two gainers in the FTSE right now, one of which is Croda. Uh, in terms of percentage fallers, well, the biggest one is Scottish Mortgage Trust, on the back, obviously, of a weaker US tech set. So that one off more than 3.5% just now. Outside the FTSE 100, well, we've been talking about staffing and recruitment, and James Reid uh, alluded to this in our conversation with him. Uh, Hayes off uh, four and a quarter percent right now. That is on the back of a trading update from Robert Walters, which I can tell you is currently off by some seven percent. The defence technology group Kinetic, meanwhile, is down by uh, just shy of uh, six and a half percent on a trading update. Meanwhile, super dry. Uh, well, my colleague Mark Kleinman had a story yesterday that there was a financial restructuring coming today. That has been confirmed today and the company's also announced plans to delist from the London market. Shares there currently down some 28%. Meanwhile, on the foreign exchange market, sterling very little changed on the uh, jobs data, as you can see there. No movement on the uh, main currency pairs there. It's all about the dollar and the yen just now in the FX markets. Meanwhile, the oil price, well, that's lower for a second consecutive session. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $89.90 a barrel. That's down a fifth of 1%. Well, joining me this morning is John Wynn Evans. He's head of investment strategy at Rathbones. John, great to see you this morning. Um, let's start with China. The numbers yeah. were uh, better than expected. Well, certainly the headline GDP number for the first quarter came in at plus 5.3%. So that was a little bit ahead of expectations and also slightly ahead of, you know, the Chinese target of around about 5% growth this year. But I think when you delve down into the details, uh, there's still signs there that things aren't really taking off in the way that uh, they would have hoped. So retail sales came in a little bit weaker than expected, industrial production a little bit weaker than expected, uh, and particularly fixed asset investment is weak as well. So, for example, new uh, home building was down 25% year on year. 
Uh, the overall property sector investment down about 10% year on year. You're still seeing that sort of lagged effect there of the, um, the, the slowdown in the property industry. So it, it's still a bit of a mixed bag. And I think what we saw was that, for example, there was decent export growth. And obviously, with a weak currency, that's helping and a bit of a pickup in global trade. Uh, some sort of local authority investment, a little bit sort of debt fuel, government sponsored growth, as it were. Uh, but overall, still, we're, we're you know, struggling to uh, reach escape velocity with the Chinese economy at the moment. Yeah. Now, what do you make of the jobs figures? I mean, it's, you could see by the way the pound has moved, the fact that it hasn't. I mean, this is a real dilemma for the bank. The labour market's softening, but wages growth is still strong. Uh, indeed. Well, this, you could say this is what we pay them the big bucks for to make these <laughs> sorts of decisions, if we do. Um, I think the truth of it is, it, it, you know, it's a mixed bag. And I heard your uh, correspondent earlier talking about the lagged effects of wages. But, you know, we've still got labour shortages in the UK. There's, I think the number was 2.8 million people in long-term unemployment at the moment. And uh, you know, a lot of that is health related, whether it be mental health or physical health, uh, long COVID, all these sorts of things. Um, so that's still having an effect on the jobs market. I mean, you know, you could say the good news is, is if inflation is coming down, as it is doing currently, certainly at the headline level, and it'll be kicked down again next month by the lower energy bills, um, then, you know, real wages are going up. So if you've got a job, you're probably, you may not feel it, but actually you're not doing too badly at the moment. And then, yeah. as we've seen, you know, other elements of the economy sort of, you know, doing OK in the retail sector, for example. Um, but then, as you've also mentioned, you know, un you know unemployment has gone up. We've seen the employment uh, agencies uh, coming in with some slightly underwhelming numbers. I think Michael Page was on uh, that as well this they morning, were, yes. for example. So it, it's a really mixed bag at the moment and, and quite difficult. But I think when push comes to shove, you know, the Bank of England will say we're more going to be more focused on supporting the employment market than worrying too much about inflation at the end of the day, perhaps. Mm. Now, what do you make of the general mood in equities just now? I mean, uh, the market took what happened at the weekend, Iran attacking Israel in its stride, but it's yeah. these US uh, retail sales figures that seem to have upset the apple cart. Well, that's the latest one, and obviously on top of the CPI data last week, so it's showing still you know, what looks like quite strong underlying strength in the US economy. And then again, you can still see some cracks in some of the employment data over there as well. Job openings are coming down, for example, uh, in the US economy. Um, but you know, it, it's a problem, you could say in some ways, it's a good problem to have, it's a problem of strength. I mean, you know, the US economy looks like it's on track to be growing around about 2.5% annualised in the first quarter. I mean, that's way ahead of what we're seeing in Europe and the UK. Um, so, you know, to that extent, the US is in a very different position. So, you know, if the truth is, if the Fed is not going to be able to cut rates because the economy is strong, is that the worst possible outcome? Obviously, the key thing is whether or not accel inflation accelerates back up again. We've seen outlying some people beginning to talk about the next move in Fed rates being up, perhaps. Um, we don't subscribe to that at the moment, but obviously it's, it's something of a tail risk, and I think that would potentially put markets under a bit more pressure. OK, John, got to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Still to come here on Business Live, as today's job figures underline the scarcity of skilled workers, I'll be hearing from the Chief Executive of Learning Technologies Group. Stay with us. in the world. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it. it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on, a lot of heat still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in news. at all, a lot of them extremely thin and very frail. Look at her arms, I can put my entire hand round. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. 
Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. The world's largest falls now down to a trickle in places. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Oh! <laughs> close and personal with the rhino. This is what makes the job so fantastic. This is the game changer seat. Look, it even comes with binoculars. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back. A couple of uh, stories to mention to you. Shares of Dr. Martins have fallen by as much as 30% this morning after warning that it was facing tough trading conditions this year. Dr. Martins said results for the financial year just ended would be in line with expectations, but in the year just started, profits could be down by as much as two-thirds in a worst-case scenario. It blamed weaker demand in the United States, its largest market. The company said its chief executive, Kenny Wilson, who oversaw its stock market flotation in 2021, will step down at some point in the next year. And the owner of the UK franchise for the TGI Friday's restaurant chain has agreed to buy the brand's US parent for £177 million, including debt. Hostmall Group said the proposed transaction would reunite two businesses that are a natural fit and were one business until as recently as 2014. Well, TGI Friday's Inc. is the master franchiser to 493 franchised outlets, including 128 in the US, the 89 in the UK host, operated by Hostmall, and a further 276 across a further 42 countries. Shares of Hostmall up by 5.5% on that news. Now, the unemployment figures published today underline the scarcity of skilled workers, making it all the more important that employers get the best from their workforce. Learning Technologies Group, which employs 5,000 people worldwide, offers customer services that support recruitment, talent mobility, performance training and pay. The company, whose customers include Visa, Caterpillar, Ford and the Tate Modern, today reported a pre-tax profit of £45.6 million for 2023, which was up 13% on 2022. With me now is Jonathan Satchel, Chief Executive of Learning Technologies Group. Jonathan, good to see you this morning. morning. Um, sales were slightly down during the year. What, what's going on there? Uh, well, you might have noticed that the macro uh, backdrop is not particularly uh, uh, healthy at the moment. And uh, I think it was a pretty resilient performance, actually. Um, every company obviously examined their spend last year. We deal with large corporates and governments across the world. And what I'm pleased to see is that, of course, there's an element of discretionary spend in, in all of their learning and, and development budgets. But mostly, uh, they were taking the view that they have to consider continue to uh, retain and develop talent to survive uh, and flourish as businesses. So we saw a small amount of diminishing of their discretionary spend and that's what resulted in the results. Do you see yourselves returning to top line growth this year? Um, I've given a cautious outlook. I mean, you know, there's a lot going on, as your programme has said in the last 20 minutes. Um, I think it would be too early to call it, um, but I can tell you that we're tightly correlated with the macro. So the moment the animal spirits return to business, I, I see us growing again. I mean, you have a wide range of products and services that you offer to all, all manner of uh, businesses. Where are you seeing growth strongest just now? Of course, AI and AI-enabled capabilities is a big factor. Um, but we're also we're seeing uh, companies are considering whether they do their, manage their learning themselves or whether they subcontract that to organisations like us. Because I think in tighter times, everyone looks for those possible efficiencies and cost savings. And naturally, we do it for a lot of organisations across the world, so we're pretty efficient and effective at doing it. 
it so we can save companies money. How big is the addressable market in that sense? Oh, uh, it, these are difficult stats to get a, to put a finger on. Um, uh, you often hear the corporate training market being described as about $400 billion globally, but an awful lot of that is done in-house. So we think circa $100 billion. So it's a, it's a meaningful market. What about the customer mix these days? I mean, obviously, I mentioned some of the really big names that uh, you, you partner. What about at the smaller end? I mean, you've got a sort of growing SME base as well. We have, but only in certain capabilities. So we have a, a, a recruitment tool, um, and incidentally, we're seeing similar um, uh, results that to, to the ones you described this morning. Um, but small and medium-sized businesses use it to attract talent, and we're adding further capabilities like onboarding and, and uh, some compliance aspects to enable them, when they bring the talent on board, to develop them through the organisation. But that's our only real exposure to small and medium-sized enterprises. We really are a, a large enterprise corporate business in, in real terms, and we do a lot of work with big multinationals and government. And it's a lot of that is about upskilling the workforce. It is, and, and the skills gap is, without question, the hottest topic. And we don't need to evangelise or persuade C-suite to worry about it anymore. They are very concerned about it. AI, of course, adds another factor. Hybrid working as well adds a factor. You know, we, need, we mustn't forget that two or three years on from, from COVID, we now have lots of new starters in the workplace that haven't had the benefit of five days a week picking up things by osmosis from their colleagues. So that plays to our strengths in terms of delivering informal learning in an appropriate way. You mentioned AI there. You, you launched an AI learning programme in October last year. What, what sort of things are on offer? So that one was particularly, we, we, we call ourselves a fast follower. We didn't join the, the big hullabaloo and trend at the very beginning because I, I was very fearful that this thing was going to explode very quickly and then there would be some disillusionment about what had happened. And frankly, I think we're seeing that at the moment. People are saying, we implemented it, but it's not worked quite as well as we thought. And so what we did was waited. We've, we've incorporated Gen AI capabilities into all our software. That's just table stakes, frankly. But what we've done is looked at how customers are going to get the best impact of AI in their businesses in terms of developing people. And we're calling it the human, human AI interface or human and AI together. Um, and we're learning a lot. Our customers are, are our greatest um, uh, information source. And so um, we've been able to dis distill that to many, uh, many organisations now. OK, Jonathan, busy day for your results today. We do appreciate you spending the time to chat. Thank you very Thank much. You. It's good to see you again. That's it from me. I'll be back with our afternoon edition at half past four. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up after this short break, it will be Jane Secker. See you later. Cheerio.